Now we're going to look at the functional dental exam in depth. And remember, as I'm examining Christy, what I'm going to look for are signs of active inflammation, and I'm also going to look for potential inflammatory triggers. In addition, I'm going to be categorizing my findings into three key areas, infection, autoimmune, and oxidative stress. So the first part of our exam is going to focus on the temporomandibular joint area. And the two areas of the matrix that this specifically relates to is structural integrity and communication, or mental function. So to begin the functional exam of the temporomandibular joint area, what I'm going to do first is palpate the joint. I want to feel for clicks, for cracks. I want to feel for joint positioning. I want to see, does the joint move smoothly during the opening and closing stroke? Open, close. Open, close, place my fingers in the ear to feel the condylar position. Open, close, open, close, feels good. I'm going to listen to see if there's any joint noises and joint sounds. Open, close, open, close. Any pain? No. No pain? So she doesn't have any inflammation. If you found a patient with inflammation, remember that this is a synovial joint, like other joints in the body. And so you're going to want to think about if this joint is inflamed, does this inflammation communicate and exhibit in other areas of the body? You're going to want to think about your vitamin D levels, your essential fatty acids, because of the role that these particular micronutrients play in inflammation. The next thing I want to do is I want to take a look at her muscles. We call them the muscles of mastication. I want to palpate the masseters, the pterygoids, medial and lateral. Any soreness, Christy? Yeah. Little a little soreness bit. on that side? A little bit. Okay. How about here? Is it better? Mm -hmm. What's interesting is that we've got the amalgams removed on this side of the mouth. We still have amalgam remaining on that side. And while I wouldn't consider the amalgams to be a primary cause for uh, muscle tension, what I've found in the collaborative practice, my private practice, is that if a patient persists and has chronic muscle stress and muscle tension, sometimes the electrical activity of the metals can uh, have it persist and have it be exacerbated um, and, and not resolved. Any soreness here? And then lastly, close together for me, I want you to tap your teeth together. What I'm checking for here is, is the bite balanced. Are there any teeth that hit harder? How does your bite feel? Good. Balanced Action. and even? Very good. Good. Why that's significant is there are two recent articles, one called Mastication in the Mind, the other Occlusion in the Brain, but it began to m explain the relationship between our bite and our cognitive function. It talked about the pathways and uh, the, along the uh, proprioceptive fibers that return to the amygdala and uh, have a dramatic effect on cognitive ability. There was another study done where uh, patients, nursing home patients, uh, patients that had more of their teeth were fine to have a higher cognitive function than patients without their teeth. So evaluating the evenness of the bite is a critical part of this as well. So moving on to the second part of our functional dental exam, we're going to examine the lips. I'm looking to see if there's any cracking, any fissuring, any angular stomatitis, which of course relates to nutritional status, uh, particularly B vitamins. The other very important thing that I'm going to take a look at is I want to look at their mouth positioning, their lip positioning, how they hold their lips at rest. It's going to give me some insight into uh, their breathing patterns. Are they a mouth breather? Uh, do they have an inability to breathe through their nose and need to breathe through their mouth in order to uh, have adequate uh, oxygen intake? So if you notice in this, Christy can very easily keep her lips together. Take a break, deep breath. Okay. Yeah. So there isn't any uh, obvious breathing patterns or uh, breathing anomalies in the, the lips look great.
So the third part of our functional dental exam is evaluating the soft and hard palate. And specifically what we think about in terms of the functional medicine matrix is we think about assimilation and we think about defense and repair. I also uh, will begin the oral cancer exam by evaluating those areas. The oral cancer exam will continue as we evaluate the tongue and the mucosa. But the in, uh, initial part of the oral cancer ex exam is there. I'm going to want to look uh, to see the tonsils, see how large the tonsils are. Uh, that can, enlarged tonsils can be a factor in sleep apnea and uh, breathing disorders, which would then uh, prompt a referral uh, to a physician for appropriate treatment. So I want to see how does the tongue uh, rest with respect to the uh, soft palate? Does it occlude the soft palate? Does it occlude the airway? So let's begin and take a good look inside. Open for me. All right. It's the tissues of the soft palate and hard palate look great. I'm going to depress the tongue a little bit. You're going to just say ah for me. Ah. Really want to visualize the back of the throat. Say ah again. Ah. Okay, great. Her tonsils are not enlarged. Your airway looks great. And um, so if we had a patient with enlarged tonsils, um, what we would think about is chronic infection. We think about their antioxidant status. Um, we think about their Th1, Th2 uh, interchange, the uh, humoral versus innate immunity. Uh, we think about allergy and talk about perhaps uh, do they have any food sensitivities that we need to think about. The fourth part of our functional dental exam is the tongue. And when we look at the tongue and examine the tongue, the areas of the matrix that we want to think about are defense and repair, assimilation, and structural integrity. So I'll have the patient put the tongue out and grab it, the tip with the cotton. And I look at the color. I look at the size of the papilla. I look to see if the lateral borders of the tongue are smooth, are they scalloped, are they red. This relates to nutritional deficiencies. I look to see if there is an even pattern and presentation of the papilla on the tongue. Geographic tongue is a manifestation where we have bald spots. And when I see geographic tongue, I actually uh, think of gluten, immediately think of gluten and we start talking about uh, gluten sensitivity testing. I pull out the sides of the tongue. Oral cancer loves to lurk down in these lateral borders. And I take, we, we take a good look to make sure that those areas look fine. The fifth segment in our functional dental exam are the gums. And the areas of the matrix that we want to talk about or think about when we evaluate the gums are assimilation, defense and repair, structural integrity, biotransformation and elimination, and transport, specifically as periodontal disease relates to cardiovascular disease. So as we examine the gums, first of all, you want to look for the color. Is it pink? Are the gums pink or red? Are they firm? Are they boggy and erythematous? When you press on them, do you see any bleeding? Any exudate? Is there an odor? Oftentimes with periodontal patients, there's a very distinct odor, we term it perio breath, that will tell us uh, about the stage of the disease and, and how the prevalence of that odor uh, really gives us a window into how significantly entrenched the disease is. So in this case, Christy has beautiful gums because she flosses and brushes. Do you notice any bleeding when you floss? Not much. Okay. Not much? A little every so often. So and can you tell us where well, you noticed? It was more following my pregnancies and then okay. following the deliveries and I would seem to improve. Okay. I'm two years out. All right. Do you notice any more inflammation in your gums around these metal fillings? Around yeah, absolutely. The one that's left definitely feels irritated, and it's raw and sore when I brush. Okay. All right. So there are different reasons that the gums can bleed. It's important to distinct to differentiate between gingivitis and periodontitis. But what is you, universal when you consider the gums and gum health are the nutritional considerations. The macronutrients are just as important as the micronutrients, especially protein. 
in order to have healthy gums, we need to be sure that our patients are consuming adequate amounts of protein. The micronutrients that we're going to think about when we talk about periodontal diseases, we're going to carefully consider our B vitamins, specifically folic acid. So if you have patients with methylation defects, you're really going to want to can think about uh, supplementing with activated folic acid and really honing in on their diet and making sure that they're getting enough uh, of those leafy green vegetables that contain uh, the high amounts of folic acid. In terms of antioxidants, vitamin C and CoQ10 are critically important when it comes to gums. And finally, um, the minerals, calcium, which was interesting, as you said, at the end of your pregnancies, um, your gums were bleeding more. Again, calcium is, a, is, is something that women are typically depleted in towards the end of pregnancy. So calcium, zinc, and iron are also uh, very, very important as we consider healthy gums. Moving on to the sixth segment in our functional dental exam, we're going to look at the buccal mucosa. The areas of the matrix that we're going to think about as we examine the buccal mucosa are assimilation, defense and repair, structural integrity, and biotransformation and elimination. We're going to look for lesions. We're going to look and evaluate salivary flow. So let's take a look. Open for me. So we're examining all of the tissues inside the lips, and on the side of the cheek. If we see lesions present, we want to look at them to see if they're in proximity to dissimilar metals. Oftentimes, um, when, if there's a galvanic current that's being elicited between, say, a gold crown and a mercury amalgam, you may see uh, something, some lichen planus or some sort of a, a white hyperkeratotic lesion that can exist on the cheeks. The other thing we want to take a look at is we want and we want to take a look at the parotid duct and we want to see what the salivary flow is like. Um, do you ever experience any dry mouth? Yes. You you feel that you have an adequate amount of mm -hmm. saliva all the time. Mm -hmm. Salivary flow is important because it's critical for us to have adequate saliva to begin to digest and uh, process the food that we eat. Um, really, as we said, you know, it's all the same tube. The gut begins in the mouth. And so the inadequate saliva is critical as we masticate and as we chew. If we begin to see people with patients with xerostomia, a lot of it these days is pharmaco pharmacologically induced. But if you've got a patient where that would not be a critical factor, let's think about their diet, specifically gluten. Um, we know now that there's a very strong link between Sjogren's and, uh, and gluten intolerance and gluten, gluten sensitivity. So by looking at salivary flow, we can maybe get an early peak and an, an early read on potential gluten sensitivity. All right, for our last segment of our functional dental exam, we're going to take a look at the teeth. The teeth, quite uniquely, relate to all seven aspects of the functional medicine matrix. As we take a look at the teeth, what is important to observe is what's the general condition of the teeth? Does the patient have all their teeth? Are they missing teeth? If they're missing teeth, it's going to give us some insight into the history of their health. And appropriate questions to ask would be, why, why uh, did, are they missing those teeth? You want to ask the patient, do you have any root canals? Root canals are important because as we consider how we're going to categorize the information that we're going to gather as we look at the teeth, remember again, we're going to think about the three areas, infection, autoimmune, and oxidative stress. So with respect to infection, we've already talked about periodontal disease and the infection there. It's critically important to assess whether they have root canals and are, is the patient managing that root canal? Is their immune system managing the challenge that a root canal can present to their immune system. Um, that is not going to be able to be discerned from simply looking in their mouth, but that would be an important finding that you would want to record on your sheet. So the other thing we're going to take a look for as we look at the teeth is we're going to look at what a kind of restorations do they have in their mouth. Are there metal restorations? Are there dissimilar metal restorations? Are the crowns all yellow gold? Or are the crowns a silver color metal? Because oftentimes, uh, the gold that's used for a lot of these 
porcelain crowns um, is, a, is a base metal uh, that is neither of high quality um, and is typically not compatible uh, with respect to uh, the other metals that are in there. As we evaluate mercury amalgams, we want to see are they bright and shiny and silver or are they black and corroded? When we did our examination with the galvanic paper, as we put galvanic paper in and as they begin to have a reaction, then we're really going to want to be suspicious of electrical activity. And it's important to remember that it isn't the fact of the metals in the mouth that can be an issue for that patient. It's the dissimilar metals. Dissimilar metals set up an interaction, an electrical interaction, have, which then dump metal ions into the bloodstream and can then trigger an autoimmune response. The other critical thing to know about the mercury amalgams is that the effect, uh, the mercury, because mercury amalgams do leach. I think it's been well documented. Studies have really shown that these materials are not inert. And it has a particular impact on the energy segment of our functional medicine matrix. It will compromise CoQ10. It will compromise mitochondrial function. So it's important when we see a patient, particularly a patient with corroded amalgams, that we really uh, think about their nutritional status. We think about their antioxidant status. Uh, we're going to want to make sure that they have adequate amounts of CoQ10 and vitamin C. We want to know that they have adequate calcium. There's an, when our teeth, when children's teeth erupt, they're not fully mineralized. So it's important, their calcium uh, consumption during those formative years is critically important in order to form that hard protective enamel covering over the teeth. In our clinical practice, we've developed a different philosophy on tooth decay. I believe strongly that there's an inflammatory component to decay, that the mouth has an inflammatory environment that allows the decay to be more prolific in certain patients. When you see patients with high decay rates, when you see patients with a lot of dental fillings, older patients, when you have your older edentulous patients, let's begin to consider what were the factors that got them there? One thing that we have found repeatedly in patients with high decay rates and in patients, even our edentulous patients with full dentures, is that there's a strong correlation between gluten sensitivity and the amount of decay that a patient has. And so we have been uh, oftentimes testing these patients and they're coming back with celiac genes and also gluten sensitive genes that have been activated. As we conclude the functional dental exam with the teeth, we see that it relates to all aspects of the matrix as well as all the other structures of the mouth. Consider what you have found by examining the teeth in terms of its relationship to inflammation, to toxicity, to heavy metals, and to dietary and nutritional imbalances. Thank you.